good evening, everyone. And uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, stand up here at the annual meeting and help to introduce our uh, program. But first, before I start, uh, a couple words is that we wear a number of different hats at Plant Moran as it relates to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. One is we're the auditors. And so we do look at the books and records. It's important to have an annual meeting. And we want to add our congratulations to Jane, the staff, the board for such a successful year. Very well done. Uh, second is that of sponsor, and so it's very important for organizations to help sponsor this not-for-profit organization and the community's conversation, and so we consider it a privilege to be able to do that. And third is that of supporter, because I keep coming back to the idea of the community's conversation and that within the community I have the privilege to serve on the Experience Columbus Board and chair that board and to see all of the different synergies and collaborations that our organizations have together really is a treat. And so with that in mind, we'll start with the preview of what the programming is being planned for the 40th year of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. In 2016, CMC will be presenting a series entitled Best of Columbus, the stories that define us. And tonight is just a sample of what's to come. So let me personalize this, too, before we introduce the, the uh, staff here. When I was asked to introduce and told the date, I said, uh-oh, I'm not going to be here this year. Why? Because I'm currently on a 30-day sabbatical, which is a program at Plant Moran that allows us a complete disconnect, but I chose to spend my 30 days in Columbus. So I ask each of you to think, if you had 30 days to do whatever you wanted in Columbus, what would you do? I'm pleased to report I go back to work on Monday, and I'm still not bored. So with that, your forum flyer has the information on each of our panelists, and let me keep my introductions brief. Uh, first up, and you can just wave, we have Franklin County Commissioner John O'Grady. Yes. Next, the former Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, who is an attorney now at Jones Day, Yvette McGee-Brown. <laughs> One of Columbus's most knowledgeable historians, Jeff Darby. And uh, show of hands, how many of you, you know, after I introduce here, pick this up every time you see it, you know, within stores and such? I know I do. Is the editor of 614 and Stock and Barrel Magazine stand up comedian Travis Howisher. And of course, our moderator and leader tonight is one of Columbus's most popular journalists, Gail Hogan. So, Gail, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm so glad that you are all here this evening. And as we've heard earlier, the Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded on the idea of sharing thoughts and ideas, providing information and stimulating discussion. So tonight, as we go into that 40th year of telling Columbus stories, I'm pleased to have a wonderful panel of guests here who will share some of their favorite stories of Columbus, what defines us now, and what we might expect as we go forward. So I'm. I'm going to give a little bit more introduction to who these folks might be. Um, our first panelist, Yvette McGee-Brown, a native of Columbus, which is important because we're going to talk about stories, and some of those might go back a ways, um, has the distinction of being the first African-American female justice on the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, that was also Franklin County Common Pleas judge and founding president of the Center for Child and Family Advocacy at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Currently, Yvette is a partner in the law firm of Jones Day, so thank you for being here, Yvette. Mm -hmm. Also on our panel this evening, Travis Howisher, the editor-in-chief of 614 Magazine, a magazine that is a must-read if you want to know what's going on in the city, <laughs> Travis. He's been in the newspaper business in Central Ohio since 2002, sports editor, entertainment editor, before moving up to editor-in-chief. And I just learned that you're a stand-up comedian, so I'm hoping that we, you know. Semi-pro. Semi <laughs> I didn't say you were good. Yeah, I just right. said you were. I was like, really? <laughs> right into my bio. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> thanks for being here, Travis. Our next panelist is Jeff Darby, who, along with his wife, Nancy Reshi, founded Benjamin D. Rickey and Company, which provides a full range of historic preservation consulting services. So not only can Jeff speak to stories of present-day Columbus, but he'll also bring the historical perspective of our city to the discussion tonight. So Jeff, thank you. And also welcome Franklin County Commissioner John O'Grady, who's been a county commissioner since 2008. And prior to being elected a county commissioner, John served as clerk of courts for the Franklin County Common Police Court and administrator with the state treasurer's office. He, too, grew up in Columbus, 
one of 12 children. So if you hear the name O'Grady, he's related to them. <laughs> it's like, I was number 12, the youngest. You're the youngest. <laughs> so as we go through this evening, the discussion will be centered on your professional and personal observations of our city, special memories that um, have played into your role in defining Columbus. I'll direct questions to a specific person, but then I will ask the rest of you to join in. So the first question to Yvette, in your opinion, over the past 40 years, that's because we're wearing the same colors. That's right. Over the past 40 years, what influences have contributed to what our city is today? Oh, I know that's tough, isn't that it? Is what tough. influences? And it could be your own personal influences that you have projected onto the city or the city influences itself. I, I think downtown housing and the, the commons area have really made Columbus feel more vibrant and youthful. And then um, personally, Jenny's ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Um, because I just think we have so many more venues now going on. There's, there's entertainment. My office is in the Arena District, and during the summer, there's festivals, there's baseball games, there's concerts. I mean, it's almost hard to get out of work when you get there, and that just makes Columbus feel very grown up and very metropolitan. <laughs> so we're talking about influences. It can also be cultural, too, mm -hmm. um, attitudes. Any of you have ideas on what you think influences have made our city what it is? I think we can thank the millennials. I really? Think, I think, I do. No. Yeah. I think they're younger than Here you. Here I'm millennial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm the young guy. Jeff, I continue. Think, I think they bring a new ethic to um, living life on, uh, in this city. And it's, it's focused on uh, an environment that's real, that has a true story behind it, um, that, that, that comes from the past and is serving us in the future. Um, from what I've seen, they're a major force in what's happened. It's remarkable in the years since the recession. What's happened here? I've, I've said this to friends and family, and I'll have to say it here. I think Columbus is in serious danger of becoming cool. <laughs> <laughs> We'd better watch out. You are right. Either of you, any ideas of influences? I mean, I think at some point along the line, Columbus became a really curious city. And by that, I mean not just the people that live adjacent to the downtown core, or these emergent neighborhoods, you have people that are coming in from the suburbs to go visit a craft brewery on a Sunday afternoon or go to the bike trail. And you know, from 10, 10 even 15 years ago, that gap used to be much wider. And I think now you have a little bit more of a cohesion where like people are actually curious about what's going on on the other side of town as opposed to just in their own neighborhood. So to me, Columbus feels much more like a wholesale city rather than like, we've got to get downtown on board. All of it kind of has a little bit more uh, more unity, I guess you could say. And attitudes. I have heard many people say that we have a very accepting city in many ways. I think you'd all agree with that. Any mm -hmm. examples, any personal experiences of how you have found this city to be accepting? <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead and change the question on me right when I had a great answer for that. <laughs> you know what, John, you just you just say what you need to say, buddy. I, just, I, well, Jeff, I know that Jeff's the historian up here, but uh, from a public policy standpoint, Annexation, you know, when uh, the, the, the city's, uh, Mayor Sensenbrenner's uh, policy of annexation that's been uh, around since the 50s, uh, it, it, it shaped and formed uh, who we have become as a community and it has allowed for us to continue to grow and to expand and to become more as a city so that while all of these uh, observations that, that, that each of the panelists are making are, are absolutely very true, they're, it's made easier by the fact that this city can continue to grow geographically uh, it is not landlocked like many other cities that are our peers around the country are. Um. Very important. <coughs> and I'm going to continue with you on a personal <coughs> note because you're homegrown. <coughs> and so I want to know what memory you have of Columbus that made you decide, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to, I like Columbus. I'm going to call it home. Well, um, I grew up, I was, we moved here when I was a baby. Um, and I've been here for 50 of my 51 years. And so I've kind of fallen in love with Columbus over and over again over the years. Um, I've had opportunities to, to leave. Uh, I did leave at one point for a few years. Um, and I always came back because um, there were more opportunities here. There were more, uh, not just job opportunities. Everybody, you, you know, you can make opportunities wherever you want. Uh, there were just, there was more that was happening here that was forward thinking and future thinking. And there was just more people and more uh, things about this community uh, that, uh, that said, come here, try this. Uh, come here. Let's 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 do something different. Let's move in a new direction. Everybody here seems to be, uh, as long as I can remember, everybody here has seemed to be 
uh, very anxious for the next chapter in Columbus's history. And you know, as you grow older, you don't always, uh, you, you live life every day and you don't pay attention. And then all of a sudden you look back and go, wow, look what we've become. Look what happened. So you decided I, to stay. Yeah, I mean, that and, you know, my wife wasn't going to let me leave. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> You bet, yeah. you're homegrown too. Yeah. And so what, what was it about the city that made you decide there are not greener pastures other places? Scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> Free money. Right. Free money. I mean, because I, when, I, when I got out of, I went to Ohio University, you know, growing up here, I grew up in the Brittany you're Hills area. You're a Bobcat? Area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I'm a Bobcat, yeah. I grew, up, I grew up in the Brittany Hills area, and no, you just didn't go to Ohio State if you grew up here. But then when I was in undergrad, I started thinking about law school, and I wanted to go to D.C. I wanted to go to Georgetown. That was my dream. I wanted to be at Georgetown. And there was this woman, Barbara Rich, at the Ohio State University College of Law, and she called me every week, and she was like, <laughs> so are you ready to commit? I'm like, Mrs. Rich, you're so nice, but I'm going to Georgetown. And every time she called, she put more money on the table. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> Until my mother had one of those conversations with me like, okay, so you're going to Georgetown, you got no scholarship and no place to live. Ohio State's giving you a full ride and you can live here. So, I mean, and, and I'm so glad I made that decision because once I went to Ohio State, there was just like this embrace and all these opportunities that kept coming. It wasn't really conscious, it's just that there were always new opportunities and new experiences and my mom is here, so I wasn't gonna leave her. Very good, mm -hmm. thank you. Jeff, our city has truly grown in many ways. Uh, the last 40 years is, you know, we're talking about CMC. As a preservationist, though, have we done enough to preserve our past as we grow? Yes and no. <laughs> chicken. The classic answer. Yeah, chicken. That's a whole other yeah. forum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. if you have four hours, I'd be happy. <laughs> I, I can do it more quickly. Um, I think that the, the, uh, the fact that we have these close-in, high-quality neighborhoods that have been so celebrated in the wonderful WSU series Which is, one, is of one of the great strengths of Columbus. Mm -hmm. You don't have the, the downtown core and then a sort of unlivable donut and then residential communities. They're right here. And it's one of the great strengths of the city. And from early on, even with German Village in the late 1950s, early 60s, uh, first of all, getting recognized, taking steps to protect itself by design review, it really led the way. Uh, other, other neighborhoods followed, uh, Victorian Village, the near north side. Um, there was less attention to downtown, and, and, and frankly, it, for a long time, this was a tough historic preservation community. A lot of the work we've done working with developers, there are significant tax credits available, has been in places like Cleveland. But in the last few years, uh, Columbus building owners have caught on with a vengeance, and you can look at, at landmark buildings in Columbus. One's right behind me, the Levesque Tower. Um, the, the Atlas Building, um, the, um, uh, the Julian, you know, there are a lot of historic buildings that are getting redone for new uses, um, which is exactly what historic preservation people have been talking about for a long time. Nancy and I are determined to do a book one of these days called Why the Preservationists Were Right All Along. <laughs> um, but, it's, but, but the fact is this community is really catching on to the preservation ethic and realizing the preservation isn't just the old house on the corner and saving it as a museum. It's integrating uh, the historic built environment into modern lives. I, I don't remember where I saw it, and it's not original with me, but somewhere I read that somebody said, I don't want to live in the past, but I have to live with it. And, that, and that's what I think the millennials in particular are catching on to. They, they, as I said before, they want to live in places that have a real story behind them. They want to have options when it comes to transportation. You get that kind of option in a downtown area like mm -hmm. this, where you've got C-Bus, you've got car to go, you've got the Kogo bikes, you've got your own car, you've got Coda. Uh, they want the options uh, uh, that life in a city like this can offer, and it's only been getting better and better. And I'm from Chicago area by way of Connecticut, so I'm not a native, but my wife Nancy is. When we got married, we talked about it, and we thought, okay, we can go live some great place like Chicago, Cleveland, and so on, uh, or we can stay in Columbus. And I said to her, well, you're very close to your family, and they're all here in Columbus, she's a native, um, and uh, do you want to live in Columbus? and visit interesting places or live somewhere else and spend all your vacations in Columbus. <laughs> so we decided to stay. And, but, it's, but I have to say, in the last few years, in the last few years, and 614 is one of the examples, Craves, all these, this multiplicity of magazines that you find on the racks these days really document what's been going on in Columbus. And I've got this perspective of 40 plus years. I came here in 74. And the change that I've seen, and a lot of you can say the same thing, has been just remarkable. Mm 
and all very positive. Well, so Travis, yes. one last thought is okay. we don't have enough historic buildings. A city official recently said in a conference that he gets a, at least one call a week of somebody with a company somewhere saying, we want to come to your town, where are the historic buildings for us to redo? And there's not enough inventory. Mm. And the, for a long time, we gave them up and they went away. And you can still see parking lots and vacant land. Um, we probably need to build more historic buildings. I was going to say, we can't yeah. go back. We can't go back. We can only go forward, right, Jeff? <laughs> Travis, well, he just said all those really kind things about 614 Thank you. Magazine. Yeah, it's good for you. But you probably hear from a lot of people outside of Columbus, even outside of Ohio, who pick up your magazine when they're visiting. Or So what do you hear from people outside of central Ohio, what well, was, they think of our city? I was going to say that before. I mean, I'm, I'm the... I'm not in politics or legislation or even, you know, a historian. Like, I'm, I'm kind of like the in-the-moment cultural observer. And whether it's an Uber driver or somebody that, you know, I'm having a drink with or somebody that I meet at, like, a sporting event, if they, the first thing they tell me is, like, oh, I just moved here from Columbus. You immediately want to take their pulse. What do you think? Especially if they come from Portland, Chicago, Austin, right. a lot of these other sort of, like, comparable, you know, millennial cities with also history. And those are the ones that I, that I put a lot of stock in because, I mean, I am what you, I'm the combination of what you guys described. Uh, I live in Columbus and take my vacations in Columbus. <laughs> I mean, and that's not even to complain, but I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the, the slightly lower paying arts sector. So, I mean, like I've kind of, I'm kind of that bridge in between, you know, sort of administration and, and this class of artists and home brewers and, and musicians and the people that build these neighborhoods up mm -hmm. organically. Um, so when people have actually come from Chicago or they've come from Portland and they go, oh, this is great. I'm like, okay, that's where we're really actually making an impact. When the people get moved here for a job or they came here because their spouse got a job here and they're like, okay, well, I'll deal with it. And all of a sudden they're like, this is great. I love Italian Village. I love Old Town East. I love Gehenna, wherever they are. So I, I like to kind of like informally compile those things because that, that speaks more volumes than somebody who had some family here because that's where a lot of us ended up here, or they went to school here. That's the stuff I really think we've gone over the over the waterfall a little bit. Okay, this is a question for all of you, past and present. Who do you think are some of the notable people who have made our city what it is today? Personally, maybe somebody who affected you. We already know about the woman who gave you your scholarship money. But uh, so other people that have affected your lives with our city, or other people that you don't even know that you look out there and say, these people really made an impact on Columbus. Jeff? Mel Dodge, Recreation and Parks. He's been gone a long time, but the park system we have, which is a great system, a lot of credit goes to Mel for, for helping create it. Plus, he gave us a place to put the uh, Union Station Arch. <laughs> well, what, didn't you say it moved several times? You finally found it Only a twice. Twice? Yeah. Twice? I think it, it's not planned to move for another few years at least. To, to that end, Jack Sensen, or Jack, um, Jack Sensenbrenner certainly, but um, Jack, Jack Hanna. Hanna. Yep. Jack Hanna has um, has really put a face to this city. Uh, when people come here and they, you know, you, you when you tell people we have the number one zoo in the country, uh, they don't believe it. Then you say it's Jack Hanna's zoo, and immediately <laughs> clicks. That, yeah, this has got to be something special. And and so we promote uh, the city by using the zoo on a regular basis. Uh, but the other person is the, 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 the fellow that I mentioned a minute ago, but I also talked about earlier, is Mayor Sensenbrenner, uh, J um, May Mayor M.E. Sensenbrenner, uh, because he's the one who created the, the, the annexation policies that I spoke about earlier that laid the groundwork for what this community has become. And I, I would say um, Ohio State, from Fawcett all the way up to Drake, I mean, when you look at the impact that Ohio State has had on this community, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't realize, I mean, we think of Ohio State, we think of football, <laughs> but think about the research that goes on there, the drivers of our economy, the brain trust that they bring to our community. I mean, Columbus is known, when I go to places and I say I'm from Columbus, and they look at me, I go, Ohio State University, they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, it really does add to the fabric of who we are. And then just one more is that um, I like to think of people like John Elam, Sam Porter, Bob Duncan. When our community went through the desegregation that impacted this country in the late 70s, I was a kid in high school, and Columbus came through that differently than most every other community in the country, than Boston, than Cleveland, than LA. There were no riots. There weren't the bus shakings, because we had men like that who, even though they may have been battling 
each other in the courtroom, they handled themselves with dignity. They were community stewards and they did what was required and kept Columbus on an even keel that allowed it to move forward. Very good. Again, I'm gonna stay kind of in a... Again, because I don't, I don't operate. These guys have so much more experience with the people, like really, really making like a, a you know daily policy impact. Oftentimes, I want to cheat and say culturally, Stonewall Columbus. Mm -hmm. I want to say the people that's that have cheating. consistently, yeah, yeah, not yeah. a person, not okay, a single right, person. Okay, yeah. Um, because that's really what I think it comes down to, and I, it's speaking from my age probably, and and my sort of uh, sector of Columbus specifically. But Jack Hanna and Archie Griffin and all these people, like they're on, they're on the Mount Rushmore. <laughs> they're already they're already there for Columbus, and we appreciate everything that they do. The last five to six years has been about like, who are the rest of the people? Who is the next class of people that will that will get the city attention in a way that applies beyond just maybe sports and zoos? Again, I love those things, mm -hmm. but I, I want to recognize people like Nina West. We have one of the most popular drag queens in the entire country. <laughs> yes, yeah. no, for real. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's not just fringe culture, uh, that's Columbus right. culture. Right. That is now not fringe, that is city culture. And that and our pride festivities, our pride festivities in Columbus put on by a volunteer organization essentially, while the rest of the cities are hiring event planning systems. Like That's really organic grassroots stuff that's more cultural necessarily than civic, but it's got kind of an overlap with both. So I, that's the most been a, right. for impressive for me. And, and that comes to that accepting attitude that we have heard from everybody who yes. moves here, mm -hmm. whether they're a community leader or a business leader, so they've never been embraced so eagerly by a city mm -hmm. and other people. I'd like to follow up a little bit on what Yvette said about Ohio State. Ohio State certainly is a huge, I mean, it, it is the culture of Columbus, the, the fabric of Columbus, but at the same time, sometimes when I'm traveling around the country, sometimes what I hear is, uh, our, what, is, what is one of the things that has made our city so great in Ohio State University is also one of the things that we battle against because the perception of Columbus has had a very, very difficult time going beyond Ohio State University th around true. the country. Mm -hmm. So when, when you, somebody says to you, or you say, I'm from Columbus, and they think of you, you know, they look at you funny and you say Ohio State, and they get it, um, sometimes we have a hard time getting past that. And, and so it's been the job of, of a, a lot of the, the elected leaders in town, along with folks like Columbus 2020 and others, some of the things that we've been trying to do over the last number of years is how do we get past that? What are the things that we do that, that help us uh, break out of this image, this image problem, this perceived image problem that we have? I will say that, that uh, increasingly in the media, when you see Columbus, particularly in print media, uh, when you see Columbus mentioned, more often than not now, it's not followed by comma, Ohio. Mm -hmm. It's Columbus. <laughs> that it's, oh, yeah. it's, and it's and not, I always look for it's that It's not the one yeah. in Indiana. It's yeah. not the one in and Georgia. Georgia. It's, people that's, know where it is. We do our part. We never put Ohio on <laughs> yeah. there in 614. <laughs> now, there's, there's, we started still a, that. there's still a problem of people confusing Ohio and Iowa, and we have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> they're all four letters, yeah, and it's that's so the confusing. Yeah, and, and they're out and there Jeff, where the corn we is. Battled, yeah, the corn. We battled that when we were pursuing the Dem Democratic National Convention oh, yeah, to come yeah, here. Yeah. We were up against you know everybody else, and we all we heard was Columbus, Ohio. And, and so we, yeah. we didn't hear Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or New York, New York. We didn't hear you know anything that we heard, but we heard Columbus, Ohio. And so that we were up against that and battling against that uh, throughout the entire process. And the fact that we came in second uh, to mm -hmm. Philadelphia uh, and made such an impact, I mean, I, I, I expect that we'll have a major national convention, political national convention here, if not in 20, then certainly in 24. One of the two parties will come here. And I feel like those are the things getting centuried back to the people that have either moved here or maybe even came here to check out the city for the convention that word starts to get back organically yes. to the other cities that like, oh no, there's Ohio, and then there's Columbus. <laughs> We're definitely different right. than the reputation you have That's of the state. Right. Yeah. Well, since uh, I'm the moderator, I'm, I'm gonna offer my own observation too, because <laughs> I, <can. laughs> I can. So I'm gonna talk about the medical community, oh, yeah, because sure. as a result of, mm -hmm. and I know many of you know that I have a heart condition. Well, I had, went into cardiac arrest in 1988, and I figured I had, an, found out I had an arrhythmia. At that time, there was one electrophysiologist in this city, one. Mm -hmm. Now, there are so many, mm -hmm. and there are three heart hospitals. 
And we have three, four, counting nationwide children's medical, you cannot go wrong in this city if you need a hospital. And how many other places, and you even look around Ohio, you have Ohio Health, you have Ohio State, you have Mount Carmel, you have nationwide children's. We are very fortunate to live in a city that has grown this way and the competition between them has actually been very good for all of us. But to your point, the other thing, though, is that because of our elected leadership, we don't have charity hospitals. And that's the other thing that increases the quality of medical care you get. In Cleveland and in Cincinnati, they have charity hospitals. At our hospitals, everybody, regardless of ability to pay, gets the same care. And I think that was a deliberate decision by our leadership, the hospital leadership and our elected leaders, not to create two systems of care. Mm -hmm. And in most major cities, that is not so. Yes, yes. Very fortunate. Okay, this is a little more personal. Is there a place in Columbus that holds a special place in your heart for any reason whatsoever? I don't know, maybe you got engaged somewhere special or maybe you got married somewhere. I don't know, any place special. Even a restaurant that is your place. Oh, that's easy for me, Lindy's is my place. <laughs> food and all of a sudden you okay. jump right I jumped in. in. You give me that. I identify everything. I, I do miss the queen bee. <laughs> Dirty Franks used to be the um, queen bee. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in on this one. Um, the, uh, I would globally call it the ballparks in Columbus, meaning uh, when I grew up, when I was a little boy, my mom was just learning to drive. I was the youngest of 12 kids and we would drive my dad downtown every day. And when we drove downtown from the west side, we drove by the old Jet Stadium, dilapidated old rundown ballpark on the west side of Columbus. And we got so excited. You know, I was so excited. There's the ballpark, there's the ballpark. <laughs> and then when I was, I don't know, 9, 10 years old, 11 years old, the county commissioners bought the ballpark, bought it for a, a minor league franchise, rehabbed the ballpark. And when I was in junior high, they opened up um, what was then called Franklin County Stadium. And for $2, we used to get our dads to take us down and drop us off, and we'd go watch ball games on the weekends. And we got to watch, you know, the first years, the, the, the Pirates, and then all the Yankee players. And even though I'm an Indians fan, I, and I hated all the Yankee players, I still went and watched them play. <laughs> and then when I was in high school, it, when it, um, I went to Bishop Rudy High School on the west side. I was a Catholic boy. We didn't have a football stadium. And so that became through the, I think, the good graces of Dave Savely, who was the county administrator at the time, and also a football coach at Waterson High School. Uh, that became kind of the home field for a lot of the Catholic high schools. And so I played my three years on varsity. I played football games at that stadium uh, on a regular basis. We probably played four games a year. And on that rock hard, rock <laughs> hard, you know, on one hand, you would walk into the place and just be so excited because you were playing in the stadium. And then you'd get out there to warm up and you'd be bleeding before the game started and you were, and you were like, let's see, we're gonna have to see how tough I am tonight because the players I'm playing against aren't nearly as bad as this ground is. Um, but we played there a lot. We also played a lot of baseball games there. Um, we played league game, the CCL league games, we played sectional games. I have a picture hanging in my office that somebody gave me um, of myself at, at the plate at uh, Cooper Stadium uh, playing against Bishop Partley High School. And then, Fast, you know, fast forward, I became an elected official. They we were, you know, we're getting ready to um, repurpose Cooper Stadium. And Ken Schnocky called and asked, I was running for county commissioner at the time, and Ken Schnocky called and asked if I'd like to come and throw out the, the, first, the first pitch at the second to last game at, at the Coop. And I was, I, could, I was so ecstatic. I was like, oh, I just want to get the ball over the plate. Please, <laughs> please don't bounce it in. And, um, <laughs> and then I, you know, became, when I became a county commissioner in spring of 2009, we opened up the ballpark. And uh, I got to stand up in front of a bunch of screaming, crazy Cleveland Indians fans as we brought the Cleveland Indians farm team to Huntington Park. And mm -hmm. I've been a county commissioner now for the last seven years, and I've been to that ballpark countless number of times. I'm a, I'm a, a season ticket holder, and, and uh, we were just there, there the other night for, one, for the playoff game. And, and so those ballparks, um, even back to the old dilapidated Jets ballpark, are literally uh, some of the most important fabric of my life growing up here. And so when, when I saw the question, you know, what's the most important place, I literally couldn't get past that. That was the, the only thing I could think of, right. the ballpark. You know what so. else that says about you, John? Mm -hmm. You are really old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. 
Again, not a politician. <laughs> that was John's personal story. Yeah. Anybody else before we go take questions? I mean, my, my Franklin County Stadium, as odd as it sounds, is the Ohio State Fairgrounds. That is the bridge, but I grew up on a hog farm. I used to show hogs in 4-H, so those are, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. So those are, yeah. those were my two, those are Columbus. my two Columbuses. Yeah. So I didn't grow up here, but I spent my summer, I'm always spending my summers in Columbus. I'm always, vac <laughs> you had it's hogs. always a vacation in Columbus. But yeah, my, my grandpa sold cattle in the viaduct on the end of the fairgrounds, and I used to blow my mind when I came here and went to school and would go, you know, live on Summit and 15th, and I'm like, how those two things were the same world always just kind of like <laughs> messed with my mind. So yeah. I still I still get a kick out of that now. I'm driving to work and going downtown to the magazine. I'm like, I used to go to college there. <laughs> I used to be in 4-H there. Now I work down here. It's or, just or all you, Columbus. You drive down Kenny Road and you see the, the cattle yeah. out there. That too, yeah. like, that too. <laughs> That's what's so cool about Columbus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else, any personal stories to share before we turn it over to questions? Well, a German village will always be special to me. It's the first place I came to in Columbus. My apartment was $200 a month. I rented from Barry Zacks. Oh, took wow. a check over <laughs> every month to Barry, and it was just a great introduction to the city. And, uh, you know, I, when I arrived, fine dining was the Kahiki and High Life. That's right. <laughs> yeah. and, I did my prom date at the Kahiki. <laughs> 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 And I know you brought up Lindy's and things, but honestly, this city is becoming known as a foodie, a foodie city. Right. That's a, and yeah. you know, every time so. you turn around, there's something new mm -hmm. and different, and, and uh, that is catching attention incredible across the country. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are going to open this up to questions. And so if there is, there are microphones here. We were right there in the center. We would ask anybody to please um, go to the microphone so that we can all hear you. And don't be shy, because these four folks, these four folks are not. And so they're ready to answer any of your questions. So. Todd, you probably can just yell. I want to get over the mic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your stories. You know, one of the things when you're talking about what has influenced this community that came to mind for me was our, uh, was our emerging immigrant population and how wonderful it has been to experience it. You know, these diverse cultures coming into our community and back to that point about how accepting we are. And I just remember, so I, I grew up in, a, in, in Columbus and also in a small rural town, Mount Vernon, Ohio. And then I came, and then I went to school out in Los Angeles. And so I went from what I considered to be pretty much um, black and white, right, to a community that was very diverse. And then I moved back to Columbus and found that this community had become very diverse. And so I just, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about uh, that the emergence of this, uh, of our, of our uh, immigrant population and how you think that's influenced um, Columbus. I, would, I mean, honestly, I would say uh, it's something to celebrate, but I think we do still have a long way to go. I mean, this, this year we focused on the Somali population uh, for one of our cover stories. And essentially the, the, the inspiration behind that is it's been known for a long time for many, many people that there's a, there's a large uh, Somali population here in Columbus. Why, how many, for how long? It, the, the actual cultural understanding of the Somali people here is still not where it needs to be for the size of that population in a city like this, who does actually, uh, we, we boast about our acceptance and our, our cultural diversity. I think there's still a lot of those uh, gaps that can be bridged, both politically and culturally. And uh, from my standpoint with the magazine, it's, it's increased my desire to to, uh, to work with other people within those communities. We're doing another thing this month on the Nepalese immigrant community, growing all the time. And it's being documented by very important, uh, by very important artists and photographers and cultural ethnog ethnographers, and, uh, as, as it were, as opposed to just like your standard everyday journalist. So I, I think, it's, a, I think it's, a, it's a important thing to celebrate about Columbus, but to be vigilant that we keep doing better and making better efforts all the time. Thank you, years ago, we had, we had a white population, an African American population, and an Asian population driven by the university and by, and by Honda. Um, as a county commissioner, we work with uh, such a diverse population. I cannot, I have no idea today how many um, different languages we're translating our documents into, how many that we work with. I know the Columbus Public Schools, uh, Columbus City Schools deal, they, they have uh, over 100 languages spoken. Uh, in their schools uh, th throughout the, the community. Um, I've been working very closely with the Somali population for a number of years now. 
Uh, their numbers are about 70,000-ish, I think that's the number that CPD uses. That's no small number. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of people. Um, the the uh, Latino population is way, way larger than that. Uh, they're different populations, and from the Latino perspective, uh, they're from all over. They're from every Spanish-speaking uh, uh, country on the globe, uh, around the globe. Uh, we have different cultural um, barriers as well. Uh, uh, most of the, uh, the, for instance, the Latino populations, they're all Western Hemispheric, they're all Christian in background and in nature, where uh, the Somali population's not. It's, they're from a different hemisphere. They have a, they, they're, they're uh, culturally, religiously much more diverse. They have different, um, so there's just such, and, and so that's a huge part of what we do as county commissioners is work with these emerging populations, and there are so many of them, the Nepalese, the Bhutanese, the Burmese, I um, mean, we go on and on. We're, we're doing community gardens with them all over, the, all over, the, all over central Ohio. So it's, it is not the community that I grew up in back in the 80s, and it's fantastic. Thank you. My name is John McKnight. Um, question for Travis or, or, or for any of you that want to chime in on it. Um, so I, I work for Rife's Auto Body, but when I'm not working, I do a lot of volunteer work uh, for a local radio station, WCBE Radio. And they've put me in contact uh, and, and made me feel connected to uh, an awful lot of really, really good local music. Um, and that then has helped um, connect me to just the arts in general. Um, so my question to you is, is, does Columbus do enough to really support all of the fantastic artistic talent that we have? You know, I, th I think if you're an aspiring musician, you may think of Nashville, you know, or, or if you're in, you know, visual arts or acting, you might think of New York or Los Angeles. I mean, is Columbus attracting uh, artists from all these different, you know, segments of, of, of the artistic world? And, and are we doing enough to really just support all the phenomenal talent that we have here locally? No and yes. I mean, I, that's really what it comes down to. It's Thank no you. and yes. And it's a, it's a tricky thing. I mean, I've been a member of several commi uh, commissions and organizations trying to solve those problems because if you see me around town, I'm usually not wearing this. I'm usually holding a beer and wearing a T-shirt that says Believe in Local Music. That's how I got started writing for 614. I wrote about bands. And it's not just bands. I think it's just the arts in general. Everybody agrees to a man or to a woman that the arts are important and they're a huge... Uh, fabric of your of your culture and your local society, funding them either personally or from a uh, from a civic standpoint is a much more complicated matter. Uh, I think that's the one thing that I, I five years ago I was thinking like look at all the stuff in the short north and look at all these things that we're doing and look at Franklin and look at Old Town East and I I do have a a, a slight bit of cautious there's some optimism but there's also caution of like let's make sure we don't forget what built these neighborhoods. You can you can build you can put in your you know your five six story high rise new luxury apartments and put a Chipotle in the base, but you do have to remember that you came here because the neighborhood was cool. There is something important to try to maintain that authenticity and that local connection. And if we get too far the other way, you're going to you're going to suffer a fate that you see in other you know suburban areas where you do what's now and what's quick money, and in 20 years you got a bunch of abandoned buildings that you have to figure out how to turn the neighborhood around again. And that is somewhat a part of, a part of the cycle, but there is, I mean, for example, you, you, you work with WCBE. There's two bands that were on NPR's Tiny Desktop concert, along with incredibly popular national bands. Sometimes they draw 30 people in Columbus. So I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shared responsibility across everybody to be like, wait, how is this stuff that we don't know about? How are they not the music version of Jungle Jack? How are they not the you know the music version of Urban Meyer? And so I, I mean I do my best to to throw it out there, but, but does that answer the question? No. I like music, and I know you do too. You guys, it's only five dollars. You guys should go to more bars and watch local bands. There you go. It's really easy, very easy. Go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm Bill Lafayette. Um, I think we've kind of touched on this question, but uh, I'd really like your thoughts. If I handed you a magic wand that you could wave and change one thing to make our city even better, what would it be? Streetcars. You think? Yeah. Yep. If you want to be a first tier city, rail. you have to have rail. rail. It's yeah. that simple. I was going to say, rail. Rail. So, Jeff, you're not just talking about 
talking about streetcars. You're talking about something more that we can connect our suburbs to our Absolutely. downtown. I think, I think that can come. I think working in the downtown area to do streetcars is probably the most feasible way to start. Just, just to prove to the general public that it works, because I think mm -hmm. it will. That then could possibly lead to regional commuter rail, something like that. You know, we had a chance for intercity rail, and it went away when the new governor came in, unfortunately. It wasn't a choice he wanted to make, and it's, I think it's unfortunate, because we had a chance to, to prove it. Um, but I think if, if Columbus really wants to stay in the forefront or keep getting toward the forefront, we're going to need it. And right? that's my thought, yes, too. Like, it's, this, it's sort of like millennials, millennials. Look at the money that they spend. Look at what they want. Look at what they want. And then what this they seems want is public like, transportation. It's, 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 it's absolutely yes. number and one. Is, I, I mean, see that with Commissioner O'Grady, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's absolutely number one. It's the, and it shows you how far we've come as a city right. that we've probably shored up a lot of things that people would have thought was inadequate about Columbus for, for those uh, populations 10, 15 years ago. Now we've actually gotten to the point where it's like, great, okay, we've got, we've got all this other culture. Tell me I can leave my car for 10 days. That's right. Yeah. Or tell me that I can move into a place that doesn't have to spread out so far within this dense downtown area because you have to put in a 200 car parking garage. Yeah. Great question. We have to apply, we, ha we have to adhere to that. Anything else besides public transportation that comes to mind of things that would make our, our city better? <laughs> a mountain. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a beach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a a I large think, body of water. <laughs> I, I think we could sit here and come up with a lot of answers, but the answer is the answer is rail. Yeah. And uh, I've been sitting here trying to figure out how to not answer in this long diatribe. But I think the answer, the the the, the long and short, the, the mayor, our current mayor, God, I, my. One of my heroes, Mike, Mike, Mike Coleman, came up with this idea a year, you know, several years back. It got, it got shut down uh, on a number of fronts, um, and it's largely been ignored since. Uh, this mayoral race, one of the candidates has been talking about light rail and the, the, the fact that we have to have this conversation going forward. Uh, and it's, it's a different time, a different conversation now, and I think it's being met with a better response. Um, it's a very very, very expensive uh, thing undertaking. Um, but I think that it's one that has to, its time has come. It's also, I think, a generational conversation because I think folks that are my age and older, we love our cars. Uh, we love our ease of access. And you know, my daughter goes to school in Cleveland and she loves the fact that she doesn't have to have her car. Mm -hmm. She can jump on the, on, on, the, on the RTA and be downtown in a few minutes and, and, and go watch a concert or a ball game. And, yeah. She doesn't need a car in Cleveland, and, and she loves that. So it, I think it's a generational generational issue. So. I, I, guess. I mean, we love our cars because the city's built that way. That's right. <laughs> I mean, we love our cars because we need them in Columbus. Unless you live in Victorian Village and work in the short north, you need your car. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, mean, right. I guess my feeling is if we can drop $2 billion on a downtown freeway interchange, why can't Amen. we do rail? Yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Doyleen Williams. And the question that I have is to appeal to your sense of curiosity and your adventure off of the beaten path. And so the question is, you have just been told that you only have 24 hours left to your entire life, and it's in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> Where would you want to make sure uh, you went for one last time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Not Lindy's. Don't tell Sue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There'll be a long wave. Everybody's trying to go to Lindy's <laughs> in the last 24 hours. <laughs> It's always hard to get a table. Yeah. <laughs> you can't valet if it's the last 24 hours for everybody. Hmm, wow, that's question. an interesting question. My last 24 hours? Hmm. hmm. I don't know. It's a good chance I'd spend it at the library once it once it reopens. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, again. That's one of our great strengths. Yeah. It's an incredible institution. Uh, huh. I'd probably go there and learn as much as I could. Spend Why are you all looking at me? I'm not on the panel. There's a lot of you people. I'll be circling the city on our light rail. <laughs> <laughs> 24 hours. Yeah. I, have, I, have, I have too many friends at a restaurant owner, so I'm not going to answer for that. <laughs> um, I've been spending a lot of time working on uh, the riverfront, and, and uh, the, especially the west side of the riverfront. And so I, I would probably want to take my kids and go sit down by the riverfront and 
take one last good long look at, at downtown Columbus from that vantage point. Um, I think that folks will, and even people in this room that are very familiar with this community, if you go to the west side of the riverfront in about, uh, I don't know, 16, 18 months, once that new Veterans Memorial is open um, and you take a good look at our community, you'll see it from a different perspective for the first time in your life. You'll, you'll see it differently from COSI than you've ever seen it before. And I think I'd probably end up there. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd probably go over to the, the Mount Vernon and um, King Lincoln district. That's where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, w when I was young, my grandmother used to, there was a vegetable stand there. It was the heart of the black community. And every Saturday, my grandmother would take us to this big open um, vegetable place where we'd go in and we'd see everybody. And I probably would go there and just think about, um, you know, just what a great life I've had. And I just kind of would walk down memory lane there. And probably if my husband was with me, we'd probably go run out the tunnel at OSU football. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right choice. That's the right answer. That's the right answer. I mean, while we're making one up. That's, That's right. right. That's what, yeah. <laughs> Well, I will say, Amina Robinson has made sure that those neighborhoods yes. are going to be remembered. Yeah, that's that's exactly true. right. That's yes, true. that's exactly right. Good man. My name's Marie Trudeau uh, with W.E. Davis Insurance, which is just a few blocks down, and my condo's a few blocks farther. And I'm a Grange agent, so thank you. I'm just at home here. Um, uh, I can go a few days a week without a car because of the C bus. So I, that's a good thing. Um, my question is, I love what's going on in Franklinton. Actually, this weekend there's a big event there. Uh, but can we do that kind of stuff with the Franklinton and all the other neighborhoods without gentrification? Okay, can you talk about that? Thank you. Good point. So, yes. I can address it just from the point of view as a preservationist because the preservation movement is often accused of, of displacing people um, through gentrification, the increase in property values, increase in rents. And that certainly has happened. You certainly, you look at German Village, there aren't any $5,000 houses left. No. Things have changed. For $200 rent. Like For $200 rent. <laughs> and so that's, so certainly that's part of the issue, although with the tax credits that I mentioned that are significant investment incentives, over the past, well, it's been in effect for 30 years, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, affordable housing units have been created through preservation of older buildings using these historic tax credits that help bear the cost of, of, of doing that uh, improvement. And uh, we would argue, I would argue, that uh, disinvestment, uh, freeway construction, urban renewal, uh, abandonment of a property has caused much more displacement of people from communities than, than the preservation movement ever did. Now, you have to be careful. Yeah, you've, you've got to ensure that a community uh, is, is rehabilitated for everybody, and that's just for the people who can afford to live there. You're finding that happening in places like Wineland Park, and, and there's not time to go into a lot of detail, but the remaking of that close-in urban community that, that we'll have to acknowledge has had a troubled history over time yeah. is beginning to re be reborn in a way that is welcoming yeah. new people with market rate housing and, and paying to purchase houses at realistic, serious market rates, at the same time, cheek by jowl with people who are living in subsidized housing, uh, who certainly have a right to have decent housing and should be able to live next to somebody who makes more than they do. So there are, there are places in the city where the serious experimentation is going on, where, where the testing of techniques is going on, to try to avoid that very issue. Uh, I can't say now what the effect is going to be in Franklinton. Uh, whether whether it's going to wh what path it's going to follow, whether there'll be significant displacement or gentrification. If people are aware of the issue and take steps to address it, it doesn't have to happen. I mean, I'd rather live in the neighborhood you just described. I'd rather live in a neighborhood where there's renters, owners, subsidized housing, and all that. Uh -huh. I mean, that's that's just that's just my point of view. But I think that's what happens is, I think you kind of addressed it. It's about uh, it's about trying to move forward responsibly and always having that in mind, having in mind what you're trying to build on and what built it. Um, I mean, gentrification is in many ways the, the, the end goal of urban, renew, urban redevelopment, urban renewal, that is going to be waiting on the other side of that. That doesn't mean that it has to be so quick and so in total that it completely changes the face of the neighborhood that you wanted to come in and develop in in the first place. Because when everybody floods in all at once, whether it's businesses or houses, all of a sudden it's like, yay, great, this is the new hot neighborhood. And over almost overnight, it's totally different. 
because they displaced too much of what <laughs> of what they found was genuine and authentic about the neighborhood. Uh, but it's bringing people to the table, too. I think what Franklinton is trying to do is you've got strong community leadership, is that when you're making these decisions, you have to have the people who live there, the people who have invested in that community for decades, be part of the discussion. Wyland Park is doing that. You've got some really strong settlement houses throughout mm -hmm. the community, right. and they have to be part of it. So it can't just be a developer coming in saying, right. I want to create this new space. There has to be a partnership. And I think the city and the county try to push people to work with the indigenous leaders leadership that's there so that you don't have people being displaced because we aren't being intentional about what we're doing. We'll, we'll see soon enough in Franklinton. Um, I was just there last week for uh, groundbreaking for Franklinton Rising. It's an organization that's trying to purchase houses in the neighborhood, work with developers, work with uh, the trades, work with uh, the young folks that live in the neighborhood to teach them uh, and to train them those, those trades so that those kids can then turn in turn buy and rent those those houses, but it's uh, it's going to be a difficult thing. We've got permanent supportive housing in in Franklinton that's just been built there along West Broad Street. There's an attempt and an effort there to do that. We've been working with the community to do it, um, but we'll see because at the end of the day, when you do urban redevelopment, uh, I mean, you know, it's I mean, it's a crude way to put it, but at the end of the day, poor folks live there for a reason. If you make it too nice that they can't afford it, they've got to move somewhere. And, and until you deal with that fact, which, I mean, at the end of the day, it's being redeveloped for one reason, one reason only, because somebody's making some money. That's right. And so, it, yeah, you need people, you need, you need elect, you know, you need the city council, which they've done, when you need the mayor who's done it, you need county commissioners where we've done it, where we've tried to hold people's feet to the fire and say, you can't just come in and do this. And I think we're gonna see, we're gonna see some good stuff in Franklinton here in the next couple of years. On the other, on the other, side of that, would we have the short norths of the world and no. the Victorian villages and the German villages and, the sh and all those things if we didn't have some of the gentrification That's that came right. with us? That's right. Right. So yes. There's a balance. We have yeah. time for one more question, Andy? We, we do. Maybe two more questions, actually. Okay. A fun one for you. Okay, you're all accomplished now and uh, famous in Columbus. <laughs> I'd like you to think back to a time earlier in your career and tell us a story about somebody that you had a dealing with that was famous, maybe a Woody Hayes story or a Buck Reinhardt story, a Les Wessner story. Tell us one of those, each of you, please. There are so many Buck Reinhardt there's, stories. There are, I was gonna say, I have a Buck Reinhardt. I, 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 I miss, I miss I him and I miss what he brought like to the table. No, there wasn't, and as a reporter, it was just, <laughs> Every day was a new story. Well, let me give, so early in my career, um, I was chief counsel to, to the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. We owned the Ohio Penitentiary, which used to sit where the Arena District is, and Buck Reinhardt wanted it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I remember being in my office, which was up off of um, Freeway Drive, up by Morse Road, and my director calls me in and he's like, get your ass down to the courthouse. That is on a, a big thing trying to knock down the Ohio <laughs> Penitentiary. He doesn't even own it. <laughs> and I Buck remember Ryan, that, because there was a photo opportunity. That's right. <laughs> he had climbed into this thing, the thing with the big ball, and he was threatening to ram that ball into the Ohio Penitentiary <laughs> because he thought the state was moving too slowly in giving the city of Columbus title. It was hilarious. <laughs> Only Buck Good could story. do that. See, I love Mayor <laughs> Coleman, but I feel like I was robbed of living in Columbus <laughs> in a time where the mayor would yeah. just get in a wrecking ball. <laughs> well, Jeff, you mentioned Mel Dodge, so I do have to share this story. I was, again, a reporter, and Mel was um, always playing practical jokes on all of us reporters. I'm sure he played one on you too, Carol, on all of us. But I will have to say, when I, I told him I was getting married to um, my husband, Dan, he vowed that he was going to get me a very special wedding gift, <laughs> and he did. I arrived at my reception to be greeted by two baby elephants. <laughs> and his staff told me, you're lucky because he wanted to take them to the church. <laughs> <laughs> As my niece said, when those elephants left, this party went downhill. <laughs> 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 I haven't had very many brushes with famous people. All that comes to mind, I'm sure I'll think of something. All that comes to mind is I once saw Garrett Morris at the airport. <laughs> and another time it was Tiny Tim. <laughs> I didn't talk to either of them. <laughs> um, well, growing up 
uh, my dad was the, the, the Democratic State Party chairman, and so I grew up in this business. And so I met, I mean, I, I remember as a kid, uh, well, I, sh I should probably tell this story as opposed to the other. I was, tell you, I was gonna tell you a funny story about the vice president. You can ask me about that later, about Joe Biden and the first time I met him. But I'll, I'll tell you this, when I was, so when I was a teenager, um, I was the youngest of 12, and my older brothers and sisters had all moved out of the house, and, and it was just me at home. And um, my, my dad was, at that point, was a lobbyist, and, and uh, my mom was you know, retiring and was traveling with my dad quite a bit, and so I get a phone call, and it's, um, it's, in, it's 1980, I'm 16 years old, and it's the, right before the, the, the primary in June of 1980, and I get a phone, the phone rings, and, and I get a, uh, this Boston accent on the phone, and, son, is your father home? And I said, no, no, he's not home tonight. Can I take a message? Can you have him call Teddy Kennedy when he gets back? And he, <laughs> and he, gave, me, and he gave me a phone number, and I was like, holy, can I, okay, okay, Senator. And I hang up, and I write the number down. He comes home, I'm like, Dad, you know? And then about a week later, this is right again, right before the 1980 primary, Teddy Kennedy's running against Jimmy Carter, and about a week later, mom and dad are home, my dad doesn't. My dad would come home and say, "If it's not this person, this person, this person, I'm not home tonight. I'm not talking to anybody." This is way before <laughs> cell phones and everything else. Yeah. And my dad, you know, so he does one of those, and I'm not talking. I get, a, I answer the phone, and the woman says, um, uh, "Young man, I have. Uh, this is the White House calling. I have President Carter on the phone. He'd like to speak to your father. Is, is Mr. O'Grady in?" And I put my hand over the phone, and I looked at my mom, and I said, "Go get him now." <laughs> I'm not. I'm not telling him no. <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of the house that I grew up in as a kid. And, and when that same year, right around the same time, my friends and I took the bus from Reedy, Bishop Reedy downtown. And I, if some of you will remember, Jimmy Carter was speaking on a June day down at Nationwide, and President Reagan, or I'm sorry, Governor Reagan, was uh, speaking at, on the State House, and Governor Rhodes was introducing Governor Reagan. And so we jumped on the Dakota bus and came downtown because we thought, well, this is an easy way to get out of school for the day. We're going to go downtown and see these guys. And so we did. And when it was over, I said to my friends, come with me. We'll go to my dad's office. He'll buy us lunch. <laughs> so we go to my dad's office. My dad's wearing a pair of golf slacks. And you know, and my buddies are like, what the hell does your dad do for a living? <laughs> these guys said, no, he's going to play golf later. He takes us downstairs in the basement of the Neal house to have lunch at the Red Line, I think it was called. And we are going down the escalator, and there comes Pres or Governor uh, Rhodes with Governor Reagan. And I turned around, and I looked at my friends. I was like, he looks like a movie star, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> and I thought, well, this isn't going to happen here. So we get to the bottom of the escalator, and Governor Rhodes stops everybody and says, wait a minute, Governor, you got to meet this guy. And he introduces Governor Reagan to my dad, and he says, this guy's been beating the hell out of me for the last 25 years. He's the best Democrat I've ever met. And, and then we got to meet. Uh, the future President Reagan. So, um, and I, growing up like this, I could I could tell you lots of them. But those were, as a kid, those were, <laughs> those were really cool things as a 16 year old boy. This is oh yeah. Selfie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. There were no <laughs> selfies. <laughs> Selfie opportunity. There was no, there was no <laughs> selfie. Like, yeah, I think Blue Caucus called my dad once and just asked him for money. It wasn't like, they weren't like, they weren't tight. But you did make me think of one, though. Does anybody remember when uh, Ohio, Ohio's Capital for a Day program? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. We were a host family for Governor Celeste for Ohio <laughs> Capital oh, for a Day. Oh, nice. There you go. So I was, like, I was like eight years old and like met the governor in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> And then, we went and, and then we went to his 4th of July party at the governor's mansion, so a little something cool. like that. Nice. <laughs> Go ahead. I couldn't leave this, e this evening without mentioning that the best thing about Columbus is the arts that we have here. Uh -huh. The symphony, pro musica, ballet met, the jazz orchestra. I mean, it is a gift uh, to this city to have such vibrant arts. And I just couldn't leave without mentioning that here. Yeah, yeah. All right. I know we have to wrap up. Okay. Since we mentioned Franklinton and the arts, I have, I'm, I'm a cheerleader. Sorry, I've got to do this. Everybody should go to Independence Day in Franklinton this weekend, yeah. Saturday and Sunday. If you want to see a lot of what like Columbus culture is all about, it's all right there. Go check it out. Thank you, Tam. Travis. Right. Travis, Jeff, Yvette, John, thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you all. It's fun.